أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي I'm sitting here thinking that only uh, a talk on marriage would have this many people in a room at, at 9 a.m. Like, <laughs> mashallah, I think they strategically chose the topic for the morning. Am I right? <laughs> uh, I actually want to talk about um, marriage and relationships from sort of a different, I think, angle than it's usually talked about. I want to reflect on the ayah that is printed here, the ayah that you see on pretty much every wedding invitation that you receive. I want to reflect on that ayah, and I want to talk about uh, what we go into marriage expecting and why we need to change that expectation. But to begin with, I actually wanted to read an excerpt from my book um, on the topic of love and what we expect from marriage. And so there are some who spend their whole lives seeking, sometimes giving, sometimes taking, sometimes chasing, but often just waiting. They believe that love is a place that you get to, a destination at the end of a long road. And they can't wait for that road to end at their destination. They are those hearts moved by the movement of hearts, those hopeless romantics, the sucker for a love story, or any sincere expression of true devotion. For them, the search is almost a lifelong obsession of sorts. But this tragic quest can have its costs and its gifts. The path of expectations and the falling in love with love is a painful one, but it can bring its own lessons. Lessons about the nature of love, this world, people, and one's own heart can pave this often painful path. Most of all, this path can bring its own lessons about the creator of love. Those who take this route will often reach the knowledge that the human love that they seek was not the destination. Some form of that human love can be a gift. It can be a means, but the moment that you make it the end, you will fall. And you will live your whole life with the wrong focus. You will become willing to sacrifice the goal for the sake of the means. You will give your life to reaching a destination of worldly perfection that does not exist. And the one who runs after a mirage never gets there, but keeps running. And so too will you keep running and will be willing to lose sleep, cry, bleed, and sacrifice precious parts of yourself, at times even your own dignity, You'll never reach what you're looking for in this life because what you seek is not a worldly destination. The type of perfection that you seek can be, cannot be found in the material world. It can only be found in God. That image of human love that you seek is an illusion in the desert of life. So if that is what you seek, you will keep chasing. But no matter how close you get to a mirage, you never touch it. You don't own an image. You can't hold a creation of your own mind. Yet you will give your whole life still to reaching this place. You do this because in the fairy tale, that's where the story ends. It ends at the finding, the joining, and the wedding. It is found at the oneness of two souls. 
and everyone around you will make you think that your path ends there, at the place where you meet your soulmate, your other half, at the point where your path, at the point in your path where you get married. Then and only then they tell you you will ever finally be complete. This, of course, is a lie because completion cannot be found in anything other than God. Yet the lesson that you've been taught since the time you were little, from every story, every song, every movie, every ad, every well-meaning auntie, is that you aren't complete otherwise. And if God forbid you are one of the, quote, outcasts who haven't gotten married or who have been divorced, you are considered deficient or incomplete in some way. The lesson you're taught is that the story ends at the wedding, and then that's when Jenna begins. That's when you'll be saved and completed, and everything that was once broken will be fixed. That's where the building, that everything that was once broken will be fixed. The only problem is, that is not where the story ends. That's where it begins. That's where the building starts, the building of a life, the building of your character, the building of sub patience, perseverance, and sacrifice, the building of selflessness, the building of love, and the building of your path back to him. However, if the person you marry becomes your ultimate focus in life, your struggle has just begun. Now your spouse will become your greatest test. Until you remove that person from the place in your heart that only God should be, it will keep hurting. Ironically, your spouse will become the tool for this painful extraction process until you learn that there are places in the human heart made only by and for God. Among the other lessons that you may learn on this path, after a long road of loss, gain, failure, success, and so many mistakes, is that the, there are at least two types of love. There will be some people who you love because of what you get from them, what they give you, the way they make you feel. This is perhaps the majority of love which is also what makes much of love so unstable. A person's capacity to give is inconstant and changing. Your response to what you are given is also inconstant and changing. So if you're chasing a feeling, you'll always be chasing. No feeling is ever constant. If love is dependent on this, it too becomes inconstant and changing. And just like everything in this world, the more you chase it, the more it will run away from you. But once in a while, people enter your life that you love, not for what they give you, but for what they are. The beauty you see in them is a reflection of the Creator, so you love them. Now suddenly, it isn't about what you're getting, but rather what you can give. This is unselfish love. This type of love is the rarest. And if it is based in and never competing with the love of God, it will also bring about the most joy. To love in any other way is to need to be dependent to have expectations. All the ingredients for misery and disappointment. So for all of those who have spent their life seeking, know that the purity of anything is found at the source. If it is love that you seek, seek it through God. Every other stream not based in his love poisons the one who drinks from it. And the drinker will continue to drink until the poison all but kills him. He will continue to die more and more inside until he stops and finds the pure source of water. 
Once you begin to see everything beautiful as only a reflection of God's beauty, you will learn to love in the right way for his sake. Everything and everyone you love will be for, through, and because of him. The foundation of such love is God, so what you hold on to will no longer be just an unstable feeling, a fleeting emotion. And what you chase will no longer be just a temporary high. What you hold, what you chase, what you love will be God, the only thing that is both stable and constant. Thereafter, everything else will be through him. Everything you give or take or love or don't love will be by him, not by your nafs. It will be for him, not for your nafs. This means you will love what he loves and not love what he does not love. And when you do love, you will give to the creation not for what you can get in return from them. You will love and you will give, but you will be sufficed from God. And the one who is sufficed by God is the richest and most generous of all lovers. Your love will be by him, for him, and because of him. That is the liberation of the self from servitude to any created thing. And that is freedom, that is happiness, that is love. So the reason why I wanted to begin with that piece is because, like so many people, I think we seek marriage with the wrong focus. We oftentimes seek marriage to, as the, as the brother said, to fulfill our nafsani needs. And other times, and this is what I think a lot of times we don't speak about, we seek marriage to fill a broken or empty place in us. And while, as, as he said, there is a natural need for one another, we have to be very careful because any type of relationship that is based in emotional dependency is not going to be healthy. Uh, what we have to realize is that if you go to the creation empty-handed, so if you go to your friends, if you go to your potential spouse, if you go to your husband or your wife with empty hands and you say, feed me, and you say, fill me, you're going to only hurt yourself and hurt the person that you're asking to fill you. The reason that happens is that all of us, as Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah says beautifully, all of us have this empty place inside of us, this, this sort of uh, sadness, this, this, this hole. And it's put in us for a reason. It's put in us because we're supposed to seek to fill it. Our problem is that we seek to fill it in the creation. And when we go to the creation and we say, fill me, they can't fill you because that's not the way it's designed. It's like a gas tank. It's only made to be filled with one type of thing, which is gasoline. If you go to a gas station and instead you fill it with orange juice, oh, it's still a liquid. Instead you fill it with orange juice, the car isn't going to run and it's just going to break. This is what we do with our hearts. We have an emptiness which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put there so that we seek Him. But instead we think that our friends are going to fill it, we think our career is going to fill it, we think money is going to fill it, and we think marriage is going to fill it. And when we find out that it doesn't, this is when people break. This is, this is the real pain, this is the real heartbreak. Because you think that these things are going to fulfill you and fill that emptiness, but they don't. They weren't designed to do that. There is a better and higher way to love. There is true love, and this is the, the epitome of true love is love for the sake of Allah. This is a very, I mean, it's very theoretical. We always hear that, love for the sake of Allah, but what does it really mean, right? Do you ever wonder what does it mean? It is something that is so powerful that there's hadith that says, that there are going to be people in such a station in Jannah that the martyrs and the prophets would envy them. 
And when, it, when it's asked, who are they? It is told, we're told that they are those who love for the sake of Allah. We have the potential to reach that state. But what is love for the sake of Allah? And I would say that one way to understand love for the sake of Allah is not just why you're loving, for whom you are loving, but also where are you getting your source of fill? We all need to be filled, just like the gas tank. It doesn't run on empty. We as human beings, we don't run on empty. We can't. We have to fill. We have this, this vessel called our heart, and it must be filled. So what we do is we look to fill it. Your, my question that we have to ask is what are we using to fill it? Because if we're using, if, if, if the reason why I love my spouse is because my spouse, I seek my spouse to fill me, then that's not, that's a selfish love. That's not love for the sake of Allah. In fact, I might tell my spouse, I love you, but in fact, what I really mean is, I love me. Because I love what you give me. It really has nothing to do with you. I love how you make me feel. I love how you fill my need and, and my dependency. But there is another way to love, and that is to go to the creation already full. To go to the creation already sufficed. To go to the creation, so now you're going on a full gas tank, but who's filling you? It is the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is your relationship with the source that's filling you. Now, you're a person going around to the creation, not empty anymore, not a beggar anymore, but rich. Now you're already full, and now what are you doing? What are you focusing on? No longer are you focusing on taking, because a beggar is focusing on taking. Now you're focusing on giving. This is unselfish love. Unselfish love can only come when your fill is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't think that when you are dependent on another person that this is intense love. No, this is love of the self. When you really are filled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you're able to actually give in an unselfish way. Now I want to go back to the ayah now, because it's related to what I said. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ and خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسَكُمْ So to begin with, Allah says that it is from among our signs. I want us to reflect on that statement. We talked about how we see marriage as an end in and of itself. Every, you know, most of the movies, most of the romantic comedies, they end at the wedding, right? It's this big journey and all this kind of drama and conflict, and then the happy ending happens at the wedding. This is the same thing since we were little with the fairy tales. So the idea that we absorb, and believe me, we absorb it, is that we are going through life and our goal is to get married or our goal is to be completed by another person. Our goal is no longer to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Our goal is no longer Jannah. Our goal really is to get married. Okay, and then after that it's to have kids. And then after that, it's, you know, to watch them grow up and then they get married and they um, go to college and this and that. And those become our goals. When Allah here is saying something different, He says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ What's an ayah? An ayah is a sign. Well, let me ask you this. What is the purpose of a sign? When you're driving on the road, on a highway, what is a sign? What is the purpose of a sign? The purpose of a sign is to direct you. The purpose of a sign is to point you somewhere. It isn't the end in and of itself. You don't, you're not driving on the highway, it's like, oh, I saw a sign to my destination, and then you stop by the sign. <laughs> like if you're trying to get, you know, if you're trying to get to Virginia, and you see a sign that says Virginia ahead, like you don't say, okay, I'm there now, I got it, and you just stop your car. You know you're on the right track because the sign is pointing you in that direction. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ Allah also says here a sign of who, a sign of what. This relationship between spouses is a sign, but it's a sign of what? 
What is it directing you to? Ayatihi, his signs, from among his signs. So this relationship in and of itself, this, this mawadda and this rahmah that Allah is describing is in and of itself a means. It is a sign pointing you towards him, towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't stop there and you don't make it your destination. The problem with making it your destination is many things. One is that when you do get married, you're gonna face the disillusionment and disappointment because wait a minute, Jannah didn't start. Wait, where's Jannah now? I thought this was the end. The second problem is what happens to those who never get married? Literally, they are treated as though they are not yet hu full human beings. Am I right? They have not yet completed their purpose for creation. As though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with the sole purpose of getting married and having kids. Nah, that's not the reason He created us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us, as He says, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us, and He tells us the purpose. وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسِ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Very, very clear. Allah says, I have not created jinn and human beings except for one purpose. So negate any other purpose except to fulfill ubudiyah to him. To worship, love, and know God. It is within that context that we get married, that we have a job, that we learn, that we strive. It is within that context. But we have to be very careful not to mix the means and the end. So these people who have not gotten married, essentially, they don't have one means to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one vehicle, one route. But that's okay, they can find another until Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whatever Allah writes for them. But if it is considered the end itself, then that person is as though that person has not has completely failed the purpose of life. So this is unfortunately why we treat our unmarried sisters and brothers, or worse yet, divorced sisters or brothers, um, the way that we do. When are you gonna get married? It's almost like, when are you gonna be a full human being already? And then if they are divorced, wait, why did you stop being a human being? <laughs> or why, why are you now half a human being? We need to get things into perspective. Our purpose is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yes, Allah sends us vehicles to Him. And one of those beautiful vehicles is marriage. As Allah says, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا So it is from among His signs. But please be very careful. A sign is not the destination. It is a means, it is a vehicle. Now when you have that proper understanding, you no longer go into the marriage expecting Jannah, expecting now to be served. <laughs> because now you see it differently. Instead of marriage being Jannah on earth, instead you see marriage as a character builder. There really is no other way to be successful in marriage except to see it as a character builder. If it is something that you're seeking to fill your ego or to fill, or to, to fill your emptiness, it's not going to work. You have to enter it with the intention that this is going to help me towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That my fill is from Allah and my intention is to give, not to take. My intention is to give not to take. This is so crucial. Because anytime we talk about rights of women and rights of men, the lecture about rights of women is filled with what? What gender? Women. <laughs> and the, the lecture about rights of men is filled with what gender? Men. Everyone wants to know their rights. But we need to switch that. We need to switch that because the focus needs to change. The rights of men lecture should be filled with women, and the rights of women lecture should be filled with men. We need to focus on what we're supposed to be giving and not what we're supposed to be taking. However, that is only possible when we're already full. 
that's only possible when our fill is from the source that never diminishes. So then we're always able to give. And we don't go into a relationship starving and begging and needy. Be very careful about relationships that you enter in a state of neediness. You know how you have two types of friends? You had the needy, the needy ones, and then you had the ones that were just like, cool. How, how did you feel about the needy friends? How do people feel about needy, dependent people? It's such a, you know, it, it annoys you. And this is, this, is, this is also the design of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Don't think these things are accidental. The fact that we are repelled by neediness is in, it, Allah designed this. You know why? Because we're only supposed to be needy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We're only supposed to have that, you know, that, really that dependency on Him, that begging, is only supposed to be to him. So what he designed, the way he designs the human being is that when the human being goes to other than Allah with that neediness and that dependency and that begging, it pushes people away. People don't like that. The more you run after the creation, the more it runs away from you. With Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is the opposite. The more you run towards Allah, the more He comes towards you. The more needy you are of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the more He gives you and the closer He becomes. It is the complete opposite. This is to direct us in the right place. Now we have to sort of um, keep perspective. We need to understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has designed the world in such a way to direct us back to Him. There is the Creator and then there's the creation. And if everything in our life directs us back to Him, then it will, we will be successful. If our relationships direct us back to Him, we will be successful. There is a hadith, very powerful hadith, in, and the Prophet ﷺ had this amazing quality where he could just say a few words and there was so much meaning and depth. And I want to inshallah, you know, kind of close with this meaning because it's something I think we all seek. The Prophet ﷺ was asked, tell me something that will make Allah love me and make the creation love me, the people love me. Tell me something that will make Allah love me and make the people love me. This is the golden question, right? And the Prophet ﷺ said to have zuhd in this life, in the dunya. Zuhd is a very powerful concept of internal detachment. It, zuhd you know, doesn't mean that you're not involved in dunya with your limbs. It doesn't mean that you don't you know, have a job or you don't go to school, that you don't get married. But it means that while you are interacting with this life, with your limbs, your heart is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, always facing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So having zuhud in this life, he says have zuhud in this life, is had fit dunya, and Allah will love you. So don't be so attached to this life with your heart. Have this dunya in your hand, not in your heart. And Allah will love you. The second part, and this is the part a lot of times we don't understand. He says, have zuhud in what is in the hands of the people, and the people will love you. We have this idea that the more we chase after the love of people, the more we'll get it. And it is the complete opposite. It is by chasing the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, rather running to the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because you don't have to chase Allah, He's not running away. We run away from Allah. The more you chase, the more you run after the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will bring you the love of the people. So He's saying that do not be attached to what is in the hands of the people, and the people will love you. This is powerful because we are so 
attached to what is in the hands of the people, what we think the people will give us. And believe me, there are a lot of marriages where the problem is here. The problem is that there is a dependency that actually is not healthy, and when there is that dependency, it kind of repels the other person. I'm going to be more specific. We as women, we tend to enter our marriages thinking that the, the, our spouse is going to sort of fill every need that we have, emotional need. It's, it's about emotional needs, essentially. And so when the, that ne doesn't necessarily happen, the knee-jerk reaction of a woman is to chase after the man. So she's not getting, you know, maybe that, that affection or that attention, you know, all the time, and maybe he needs space. So she, in her knee-jerk reaction is to then seek it more, to run after it more. Well, what does this do? Any, anyone want to tell me? What does that do to a man? Opposite. <laughs> Every, if you tried it, you know. Um, that makes actually men <laughs> go the other direction. If he wants to go into his cave, the fastest way for him to come out of the cave is leave him alone. <laughs> but instead, we're like going to the cave with him and want to talk. <laughs> Let's talk. It's like, no, I don't want to talk right now. So what it does is it's like, eventually he just wants to push her out of the cave. You know, it, it gets, it gets, and this is the pattern. And, and I think we sometimes, we don't understand why this happens. If you are sufficed by Allah, it's okay to let him go in the cave because you're not a beggar. You're not an emotionally dependent beggar anymore. And when you do that, and you can give him his space, then, you know, he quickly comes back. But unfortunately, we become so frightened when someone is pulling away from us emotionally. And the reason for that is we're so dependent on it. And when we get frightened, we chase it, and when we chase it, it runs away from us further. But if you instead focus your heart on seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and getting your fill from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I swear to you, then all of your other relationships will become rectified. When you rectify your relationship with the Creator, He rectifies your relationship with the creation. أقولي فاني هذا واستغفر الله لي ولكم إنه غفور رحيم سبحانك الله وبحمدك نشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته.